while I'm not really great with emotions, like I don't ever want to talk about feelings. Like, you so, don't? No. So uh. we have an argument. I'm like, I don't want to have a big, long like diatribe about like how we got here. I just want to make you plate of baked CD, you know, this sort of like the thing that you know that I've been eating my whole life that has a strong, deep emotional connection to someone I love. I'm going to give you this as my way of saying, sorry, I threatened to staple your forehead like in the office that day. (laughs) So I think people know, anyone that knows me knows that my dishes all mean something to me and they all express a different sort of feeling. And so I'm giving you this thing and it usually has a reason behind it. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we are talking with Jennifer Morrison, interior designer at uh, RP Morrison Builders, and uh, also avid runner, cook, beekeeper, and book collector. Absolutely. Thanks for coming in today Thank and you for me. sitting down with us to talk about these kind of things. So the interaction of colors, textures, right. smells, like relate cooking to interior design for me. Like how, how do those things relate and push off each other? I mean, I think a lot of people approach interior design as just a bunch of things that you put in your house. Right. And I don't necessarily feel that way. I think there it's a feeling that you get every day. And when I am producing a meal for people, there's an emotion I'm trying to convey. So it's not as literal. It's So walk me through that. Yeah. Like, um, say, you name someone you'd like to cook for to um, have a meal with. Like anybody. someone like anyone? Anybody. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to be cheesy and see my husband because I really like eating with him. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> you guys are, let, let's pretend you've, you've had a little bit of a rocky patch. You've just right. been disagreeing. Like that never happens well, with any together, of us that so are I wanna, married. Yeah, no. But let's say that happened. Mm-hmm. But you're on the mend, you know, relationships are better and you're cooking dinner. Like, is there something that translates from those emotions into like, uh, a mending type of meal or like yeah, how's that absolutely how's, ooh, talk to me about yeah, that because i'm not i mean my my nana who taught me how to cook was not like your traditional italian grandmother right she wasn't like loving or like affectionate she was like very strong and abrasive <laughs> and like and that sounds terrible but in a very um amazing way and so while i'm not really great with emotions like i don't ever want to talk about feelings like you so, don't no so oh. we have an argument i'm like i don't want to have a big long like diatribe about like how we got here i just want to make you a plate of baked cd you know this sort of like th- the thing that you know that i've been eating my whole life that has a strong deep emotional connection to someone i love i'm going to give you this as my way of saying sorry i threatened to staple your forehead like in the <laughs> office that day so i think People know, anyone that knows me knows that my dishes all mean something to me and they all express a different sort of feeling. And so I'm giving you this thing and it usually has a reason behind it. Well, would you say you're less of a a verbal person in regard to emotions and you translate those emotions into creative output in the areas? Absolutely. That's really interesting. I never really... Yeah really thought about that um but that's really interesting to it's it's like an act of serve it's like uh if you talk about it in love languages it's yeah. like uh an act of service or a creative act of expressing right. something that's pretty interesting yeah and that's just that's how i sort of live my life and you know my the interiors that i give to my clients you know they don't always understand or want to understand the again the emotional connection i'm trying to provide them to a feeling or a thing mm-hmm. but i don't always need to explain that to them i'm just i hope that they'll they'll just get it as they live there Right. Yeah. I mean, in architecture school, they would always say the less you have to say about your project, the better it is. Right. You know, if it's just, wow, people get it without knowing anything about yeah. architecture or interior design or whatever. They're just overwhelmed by how uh, cohesive the communication of what has been yeah. created. Right. There. Um, yeah. And it's all like, you know, when I did my house, I chose a blue. This was like sort of my bold phase. And it was a blue for me that my house has a lot of windows. So when the, the light hits that blue, it reminds me of surfing and the way that the sun sort of hits the top of the water and the happiness that I feel when I'm in that moment. And so every day I walk in my house, that's it brings me back there. Okay, now and, hold on. Yeah. Surfing? Yeah, I used to surf a lot. Okay, what happened? I moved to Maine and I stopped surfing. Oh, come I don't, on. It's, yeah, I can't, I don't have the connectivity with the ocean here. I don't understand why. It like disappeared when I moved here. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So what um, what drew you to surfing that is lacking here? You think? I just used to be able to find like my own little spots with no one around. It was mm-hmm. easier to do There's in a Massachusetts. Lot of that in 
What? You surfed in Massachusetts and you don't surf in Maine? Yeah, I just, it was quieter there. I don't quite understand it, but like I feel like the oceans, there's so much traffic, so many people that my brain gets clouded. Interesting. Yeah, I want to be as alone as I can uh, in that moment. So you didn't ever think about sharks when you're alone? Because I, I, this was before sharks showed up, like in the down the cave. Now they're, I would probably never do it again. Right. I think I might be done with surfing. I, I have a huge <laughs> surfing addiction, and a lot of how I approach surfing gives me insight to the rest of my life. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting to just learn. Like if you can learn one thing well, you can understand a lot. Right. You know? And just by having that passion and understanding. Um, how much uh, in the moment prediction you have to do. Mm-hmm. You, you're riding something that's pure energy yeah. into water and it's turning into an actual form that you have to interact with, predict, yep. and understand what's coming up to understand what you're going to do next or not die. And yeah. it, that's really, um, it, it's really nice to be taken out of the con, like a you know hamster wheel that you can have going in your head constantly. Right. It shuts your brain off. And yeah, it also teaches you the more you fight it. Like if you try to go into surfing where you're fighting the water hard, it fights you right back. So it teaches you <laughs> to let go like a lot. Well, it's one of those things like if, no matter how hard you fight, it's not going to change the vast yeah. power that's coming at it. And you, you learn to uh, move with it rather mm-hmm. than fight against it. And that's uh, an interesting thing. Um, before we turn this into a surfing blog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so... The it's really interesting to me interesting to me that connection between hobbies and what informs you know what you pull from your hobbies that informs your uh what you output. Um what is your creative process in approaching a um a you know a specific any specific mm-hmm. project? Do you have a certain way that or process that you go through or do a little work bit more in, like whatever. haphazard than most? Mm-hmm. Um I like to pull basically a lot of different materials. I sort of start with that. Um, Obviously, Pinterest boards, you know, a lot of designers begin there. But for me, um, being technology-based, it all has to do with space, so space planning. Good space planning trumps, for me, any material you're going to put in that room. So if you can't can't perform and live well in a house because the interior architecture isn't done well, that doesn't really matter how pretty it is, right? Because it's going to fight you every day. So I sort of always start with a plan, a CAD plan that I lay out so that I understand the millwork, the placement of furniture, how each piece sort of interacts with daylight. And then I move on to sourcing the colors, the, you know, the, the wood, whatever, you know, the flooring, the, all the different pieces. Now, in our correspondence, you had also mentioned that you you take a very nature based approach, mm-hmm. but also a technology based approach. How yeah. do those how do those interact for you? So, for, you know, my nature based approach is I like to spend time um, on the job site, like a lot of time. I like to see sort of like what is the vernacular of like the area, what trees are on site, how does sort of the sunlight come in, you know, where's the south facing, all the all those different things, and bring that into the design. Um, I wouldn't say that. I don't think the nature basing really interacts with the very separate things. Yeah. But I do think about the environment as I'm creating the space, you know, in CAD or in Revit or whatever. Mm -hmm. So now do you work primarily with spaces that you're creating both the interior layout of walls Mm -hmm. and everything else? Or are you coming in after someone else has already laid those out? Right now, I'm only doing spaces where I'm I'm curating everything. So you have you have the ability to to help put walls where you want. Yes. Or are, are you? So you work in a family-owned business, Correct. and are and in Maine, you can design a home without being an architect. Correct. So are you are you able to do a lot more uh, in the position that you're at? Um, yeah, I mean, I, and like right now, one of our biggest projects, there is an architect, um, and he and I are just sort of, he's not from Maine, he's from Chicago. So he sort of has a lot to learn about the way we do things in Maine. (laughs) So he's very gracefully given me a lot of creative control, um, on the interior and it's, you know, how many windows, how big are the windows, the type of beams. So I'm, I'm doing all of that with him. Um, but yeah, well, that's part of the reason why I went to school to be an interior designer, because if you're, NCIDQ certified, you can do more than 
somebody who's say a decorator. So mm-hmm. that's a big difference. I can, I am allowed to construct things architecturally on the interior. I just can't touch the exterior. Right. So does that make sense? Can't touch the exterior. Not legally though, right? Right. And I'd prefer not to. Yeah. I'm really more about sticking within my wheelhouse. There are experts mm-hmm. in the state who are very, very good at what they do. And right. let's just let them do that. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, it's interesting to me that you, you have to, to a degree, you have to have someone who designs the overall, mm-hmm. who typically we'd call the architect right. doing that. And a lot of uh, times someone will invest in that mm-hmm. and then they'll say, eh, I'm going to do my own interior and uh, we ran out of money, so we're not going to do the landscape stuff right. either. You know, they're kind of the things to get cut. Yeah. And it, it it's just a pragmatic thing that you run into that because you, you got to get the house first yeah. up to have a place where you're not freezing. <laughs> um, but it's, I've realized how incredibly uh, integral and highly personal and integrated interior design is. Right. Uh, and I, I really, you know, going into uh, architecture school, I didn't, I didn't think about it as much. I thought for about most everything from the outside in. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, uh, especially as a photographer too, I'd always favor, uh, no, no, put the exterior on the cover. These are yeah. great. And you know, the pushback would always be, no, it's interiors that sell, you know, magazines, but it's also where you spend most your time. Yeah. You know? And that's, that's really, it's been an educational process for me, but it's kind of, uh, just pragmatically, it, it doesn't get as much attention in a, in a building process. Oh, you know. see, I, I think it should because oh, yeah. the arrival experience, like that's your first, that's where the joy first happens when you drive into your driveway or whatever and you see this, I mean, the exterior is crafted exactly to your specifications. Like for me, I'm an architecture nerd anyways. I just really love how it influences our lives. So I think that should be a primary focus. Right. Um, it's probably bad for my industry. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're inseparable. And, yeah. and they're just, yeah, they're, they're, they just, they work. But I think just with our, with the realities mm-hmm. of money, you know, it's kind of, my wife and I are at that point of we've got our house done and now she wants to bring in an interior designer and like it, it's offensive to me. Sorry. I'm, oh, but no. You understand? It's, yeah. Like, it's like, this is my personal space and I'm talented enough to do this. I can do it. But everyone knows, like, you know, you're not going to, for the level of quality that you produce, right. you're not going to go pick up a camera and no. go try and shoot it. I've tried that. I'm not good at it. And w- I'm not an interior designer, but, you know, my my attitude and, and my thought process, like, no, you can do this, you know, and, yeah. and my wife are definitely, my wife and I are definitely button heads on that. So. I mean, it depends on, I think, the level of design. So, I mean, I keep all these details in my mind always. They're just floating around in there that my clients never know about. Because, you know, I do millwork drawings. I do all the shop drawings. And the amount the amount of things that I have to think about to prevent, like, disastrous mistakes, it's right. just huge. So I think it depends on what you're doing. Like, if you guys are picking out furniture and finishes, and yeah, you could probably make your way through that. But sometimes y- you do need an expert to, like, help you figure out spatially the configurations and, right. again, the construction details. What is What is your experience with the process of interacting with clients, being that it's such a, it's your interior space where you live and the dynamic of working with, if it's a couple, what mm-hmm. have you found the dynamic of working with couples to be? They usually argue like all the time. Do you have your marriage counseling certificate? Or I usually just should tell you them have hush up. up. Yeah, I'm very strong with my clients. So I'm like, I really need you guys to just maybe go in your own separate corners for five minutes and then come back when you want to be adults. They, it's, really? it's very passionate for a lot of couples because, you know, I think in marriage you're both trying to push your own identities and then you want those identities to converge in the space that you're both going to live and you have to both be really happy there. So it's, it's a very fueled argument usually. Do you find, uh, do you find any conflicts within the dynamic of, 
Um, I mean, the stereotypical conflicts could be that, you know, it's a heterosexual couple and the woman's the one who's going to, this is her home and it's an extension of her. And, you know, this yeah. is the stereotype and you're another woman coming in and kind of telling her, well, this is, this is a better thing to do. And the, here's what good taste is. And, yeah, you know, and, you know, it could be flip flopped or any which way, obviously, but there's still that dynamic of there's going to be someone who's a homemaker and has more identity mm. I, tied into the house. And then you're coming in and kind of influencing and what they should issue. have as their yeah. identity. Yeah. Women, the women in the relationships always are perfectly willing to give over control. Really? Totally. Yep. Usually they're the most, um, they need the most reassuring. Like they have ideas and they need me to, like I find that to be the biggest part of my job sometimes is it's okay. Like you can lean into this, just giving them that reassurance. Mm. It's the men, the men are the trouble. <laughs> I think my wife would probably agree with you. I, th I think there's probably no worse existence for uh, someone being married to an architect who also wants input on the house. Yeah. Because the architect's like, I'm trained in this. I can do this and right. I can do the interiors too. And then my wife's like, but I have thoughts and opinions too, but I'm professionally trained. I know all about this. I'm the one, you know, Yeah. that's a lot of dynamic to oh, yeah. go through. I have that same exact thing in, in my house. You know, my husband builds you know, he does all the building and manages all the building anyways. And I'm the designer. And so, but he thinks because he works in this field every day, he's like, I can do this just as well as you. I'm like you need to just be quiet. <laughs> Get the staple gun, put your forehead out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I let him pick the couch. So, you know, well, that's a big piece that was to a big, choose. Yeah. I had to just let him have that. Oh, man. He gave me that blue. I mean, I've, my father-in-law almost had a stroke when he saw this color blue in my house. So there's no way you're going to live with this and be happy. And, uh, oh, my wife's big on, on blue. It's dark. Reason. It's a dark blue. Oh, she's, she wants more towards an aquamarine kind of, but yeah. she definitely likes more cooler colors in the house. Yep. So, yeah. um, beekeeping. Yeah. I think that's interesting. It is they're, very interesting. They're weird little guys. How, what do you, what do you glean from them that, that ties into interior design? Anything? Cause I mean, they, they have some interiors. <laughs> they do. Yeah. Um, I find bees to be very thoughtful and I have learned a lot from them that, um, you can't move too quickly. You have to be careful in how you approach and, uh, have to be patient. And I think that's a lot of, that's something that people miss in interior design is that they just want to go, go, go. They just want decisions. They just want the look mm. and you have to be, you know, willing to put in the time to really mull it over. And so when I'm dealing with my bees, you know, that's sort of the biggest thing they've given to me is slow down. You don't have to go so quickly, you know, we'll get there because right. you just want to rush for the honey and you just want to push them hard or get in there and see what they're doing. And they'll definitely tell you no. <laughs> the, yeah. They like Hated. stung my hand like 80 times. I mean, I stuck oh. it in there with no glove. I'm like, we've built a relationship. It's fine. And no. Being, being no. a little too grabby being a little bit yeah they were not into that at all so as you approach um design and the creative process mm -hmm. of design uh how much of it can you put an intellectualizing process to and how much of it is um emotionally experienced and kind of gut reaction come to i think all of my design all of the pieces that have to do with color or finishes or fabrics are all gut. I don't let anything, I don't like to mull on anything too, too long. The, I sort of stress over, like I said, the placement, the details, the trim, like all the things that sort of can impact the way people live day to day. That's what I obsess over because mm -hmm. I can't let any of that go. It takes me a long time to be like, okay, this is finished. But I mean, I'll pick a wall color in one second. Really? And that's it. You just, it's just uh, an experience of, oh, I know what this I know. should be. It's, it's, yeah, it's instinctual. And, you know, clients have a really hard time with that. They really want to mull things over. They're hard to make decisions. And I'm just like, no, this is it. <laughs> this is the thing. Just trust me. Yeah. It, it's interesting when, um, the, to, for one, put a price on something that can be achieved in that amount of time. Mm-hmm. I should only pay you like a dollar fifty because that took one minute, you know. Right. But it's a life experience uh, culminating in uh, all of the abilities of perception, yeah. taste, experience that all influence that ability to precisely nail 
something right. like that. You know, it's kind of like looking at a novel and saying, it took you five years to type this out. <laughs> I could type that fast. I could give me a week to be done. You know, yeah. it's, it, it's not about how long it takes to type it out. Yeah. It's about the whole life experience and creative process that, that comes to the ability to do that. Yeah. I mean, and it's in, while picking the color itself is quick, there's a lot of me spending time in the space that gives me the ability to do that. You know, I'm being part of the construction process as well as the design process. Like I'm seeing everything happen from, you know, the site work up. I've been there the whole time. Right. And I have two very smart people, my father-in-law, and my husband, basically, you know, telling me all the nuances of this building. So when I've arrived to that point, I know exactly where it, what it needs to look like. Hmm. So, um, background in public health. Yes. Talk to me about that. Um, when I was younger, I really wanted to cure AIDS. I thought that was going to be the thing that I did. I hear they're like almost there. Or almost there. I should have been part of that, but you know, having a little FOMO, um, my, my father had AIDS. I found out when I was, mm. you know, pretty young and I just always thought that my path in life was to, to help him and help, you know, the general community and, um, met my husband, moved to Maine and just didn't, didn't work out that way. <laughs> So, so what, what drew you to design? Um, honestly, I just, there wasn't like any one thing. I've always really loved architecture. My grandmother used to take me to Cambridge all the time when I was young and I used to just wander around. And so I've always been attracted to beautiful things. It sort of started with our clients. Our clients with the age of the internet became very lost with all the decision-making they had to do. And so I sort of just landed the family business because we needed some, some help hmm. and I helped direct people. And then I just sort of thought, okay, like I can do this. There's no like amazing aha light bulb moment. I just thought I could do it better than some of the people I was watching do it. <laughs> that sounds terrible, but that's, yeah. No, honestly, I like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm very organized and I'm very, um, process driven in the sense that I don't ever want to be a designer who says, you know, do this thing without being able to say, this is how you do the thing with a drawing or an illustration or something. So I watched the frustration on the builder side and I wanted to be different as right. a designer. Um, biophilia. Am I saying that right? Yeah. People are so sounds confused like a, by this. Sounds <laughs> like a creepy word just because of its, you know, uh, ending in relation to other words, yeah. but, um, biophilia and the relationship to the aging community. Yeah. This is what you studied. That was um, my thesis dissertation. Thesis so, yeah. dissertation. Yes. And you apply it to design. I do. I mean, my long-term goal is to, you know, design for the aging community. We have a real need for it in Maine. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge issue with the baby boomers coming to age. <clears throat> and so I spent a lot of time. I was actually really inspired by Evan Carroll. He's with Build Architecture. And he started this conversation in Maine about aging in place, which I don't think is a a thing that a lot of people can do just because of money limitations. And if you don't have help, it makes no sense if you can roll yourself in the shower. Right. Um, so, you know, biophilia is more about, you know, temperature, light, diffusion of light. It's, you know, a much bigger idea than, mm -hmm. you know, just picking a faucet. So it's curing an environment that is user friendly, that people can be in every day and helps with, you know, stress and anxiety and just brings a sense of calm. So how can I, how can I be more stress free and more calm when I go home at night through my environment? Well, cause I could use a little bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, color has a lot to do with psychology. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I was talking about Scandinavian design. Everyone loves to use that word right now. Right. But people use colors, materials in Scandinavian countries because it's dark there for a few months of the year and you need something to, to combat that sort of feeling of dread, you know, right. that comes with the darkness. So I think it starts with, you know, using nature based materials and colors that promote happiness, good thermal environment, things like that. It gets very technical sauna and a hot tub and large windows that yeah. stay warm. Yeah, exactly. We've done most of that except for the hot tub. I really want to get a hot tub. I don't nice. know if that's biophilic, but I'm going to let you have that okay, one. Okay, <laughs> good, good. It'd be a saltwater one. Though. Oh, that would be, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The chlorine. I wouldn't be into that. No. Um, so you're also starting a new business. Yeah. We've, I mean, it's, it's confusing for our clients and that's where this all began. They were, were like, I don't understand. Do you have to use 
me as a designer? Can I bring my own designer? And so just trying to structure, you know, the RP Morrison brand as being separate from Morrison Design House so that mm -hmm. I could do things outside of the construction clients that we have if I wanted to. Sure. Just make it a little clearer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, write your own rules because I have two very opinionated men in the office. So, you know. Getting yourself a little distance, are you? Just, just, a, little, just a little bit because sometimes I do things and they're like, I don't, that looks, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> so just, you know, I think a little bit more independence and in, in promoting, you know, the things that are important to me. Sure. That being said, I've had clients tell me that the whole biophilia thing is more confusing than it should be for for people who hire you so i don't know if you could put it into visuals there you go you know it's funny i actually um nicole wolf who's a photographer mm -hmm. she has these pictures on her website of one of them is a kid on a ski lift and it's a very like washed out white thing but he's smiling he's happy and i was yeah. like that's that's it right there huh that feeling you walk, know walk me through it like why is the so you know what do you mean like why well like why is that why is that it like um because I don't think people really realize that their home can give them that sensation when they enter it. I mm. mean, obviously your home has a lot of different burdens that come with it, but you know, that is sort of like in this very tumultuous environment we live in, that is your escape. So how do, how do I recreate that feeling in that picture in your house every day? Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. So right. that you feel like that little kid on the chair left, maybe not specifically, but you know, this sort of little nuance when you come home every day. Yeah, I am highly influenced by my the the visuals of my environment. Yeah, as as is my father, I believe he would he would put the um, magazines on the coffee table and in a splayed fashion oh. perfectly. Yeah, and I'd go by and I'd just mess them up for fun, oh. and I'd see how long it would take for him <laughs> to like you know, like his spidey senses would go off. And yeah, he'd, like something's amiss. Um, but like that light view and all that we when we approached our house we i i went to went to war for getting like floor to ceiling windows for just part of the house in the in the living room because you can just sit there and just look out at the woods right and it's it's just really really you know you come in the front door and your view is to that and That's it's amazing. just a <sighs> right. Oh like there is something that is indescribable about that. Oh yeah. That I think people need. And you know, the only difficult thing about that is obviously these experiences, they come with a cost. So yeah. it's like, you know, how do you balance that so that everyone can experience it regardless of, you know, their income level. So, yeah. Well, I mean, if you can, if you can hire someone that's for one talented enough, but the, the, talented people are going to be more expensive but if you can yeah they always can are just kind of like get it over here and then let them know this is the budget what can you do yeah. to you know bring it in and I think if you like the the things that most invigorated me in architecture school were the projects where they actually set like some restraints on it right and because I remember having projects that had no restraints and it was just like this is unrealistic I want yeah you I can want, have a lot of fun but that's yeah, not the way it, it really goes. And the projects that I saw that were interesting to me were the ones that were made out of like found objects or, mm -hmm. you know, like these really kind of far more creative because of their limitations. Right. That that to me was always really interesting. But yeah, I mean, everything I think in design that is good comes with a challenge, right? Like the more you have to interrogate something, the better it's going to be in the end. And I mean, I don't always think that everything has to be expensive and designed to be wonderful. I think it gets a little uh, repulsive at some level uh, when it was obvious that there was no, that there's no restraint on something. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know? absolutely. They're like, yeah, sure. You achieve this beautiful thing, but you, it's not realistic. Yeah. There's something about uh, seeing like uh, we were just out in California and we went by this, uh, it used to be a gas station or restaurant. And I think no one, not enough people were coming to this guy's restaurants between Palm Springs and LA. Mm -hmm. And so he made these massive dinosaurs, like concrete dinosaurs. It's like a roadside attraction. Okay. And, and it's just like, he had these needs and restraints and impending loss of business, mm -hmm. you know, like that then created these, you know, which are now like these, you know, I think they were the ones that were in Pee Wee's Big Adventure or something too. And oh my goodness. They're, 
they're really cool. You know, <laughs> yeah. they're this really odd s- attraction, and uh, there was there's something beautiful about, you know, that life coming through in that right. way, rather than just uh, it's almost mechanical if if you have an overabundance of something for it to, to for it to get out of control, kind of like out of control kudzu weed or something that just I agree overtakes everything. Yeah, but, and I think as a builder you know, we try to talk to our clients about that a lot because, you know, this is sort of a big issue in Maine. Everyone's flocking up here and they're buying these properties and they're, you know, demoing the existing and they're putting up sometimes things that are very large and don't fit the uh, Maine aesthetic. And it's like, just because you always can doesn't mean you should. Right. I think that was from Jurassic Park. (laughs) Well, what is is the, if you had to go to some type of underpinning philosophy that drives against, not against, but kind of checks everything that you do, I mean, what would you, what would you not fall back on, but what is a foundational philosophy, philosophical approach to what guides what you're doing? I mean, for me, it's, um, just less is more. I don't believe in a lot of stuff and a lot of things and a lot of noise I like to be very quiet and strategic. And I think if we approach our projects with that in mind, people will live more thoughtfully for sure. Hmm. Yeah. Have you seen the, uh, what is it? Minimalism documentary on. Yeah. That's a little bit too minute. Like uh, that's too much minimal (laughs) for me. I don't want just like a chair in a living room. You know what I mean? You do need to think about how you're actually going to be using the spaces, especially if you're like me and you have a big family and you like being in a communal space is important to you. Um, like Marie Kondo, I tried to watch that on Netflix and I was like, no, throw all the books away. I'm not doing it, <laughs> not ever doing it. But I think there's some balance to that. Like you can find a, a medium, you know, Sure, I, th- I think it's kind of a, um, taking a good idea a little too far yeah. in, in that instance. But right. yeah. So, um, what was it? Uh, you had mentioned the, the long story of how you guys got here to Maine. Is, is there anything in there that applies to design or influences it? And what is the dynamic between uh, the two of you, both your husband and yourself, as you work on projects? Is that a tumultuous relationship or just all, all roses? Well, it really depends on what day. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a long story how we got here. It's not, I mean, we basically both went to New York City to try to, like, live our dreams. You know, me and public health, him as an electrical engineer. And we were like, we hate everything about this place it's terrible then just and maybe i think that does relate to design right because it's so it's so concrete there it's so noisy it's so like i just couldn't it stimulated me beyond what i was comfortable with and Mm -hmm. our lives basically came crashing down there in spectacular fashion and um roland my father-in-law had been approached several times by our little john island client which was one of the biggest projects we've ever done. And he kept saying no. And I said to my husband, I'm like, let's just go up there. Let's just, let's just go to Maine. Let's just live there. Let's help him with this project. It took a lot of convincing. He wanted to retire and sell the business. And, you know, we got him to, to do it. And that's sort of how we decided to continue with the family business. And it's hard. I mean, working with your spouse, it's really challenging. It's interesting. I find, uh, working the interactions that I do have with my wife that are, uh, work interactions, Mm -hmm. uh, are really easy because we're so different in our skill sets and personalities. Yeah. Whereas, you know, when we come into areas where we're both having a say on a a central issue that we both feel entitled to, you know, like money or raising kids or whatever, it's a lot more like two very strong opinions coming yeah. together. I mean, that this is like he challenges me, which mm-hmm. is not a bad thing, but he'll push me way out of my comfort zone in design or he'll tell me, no, you can't do that. And I will try to find a way to do it. And so there's like a lot of clashing that happens, unfortunately. And I hope he never hears this. <laughs> he it's always I'm always better for it. Yeah. My clients are always better off for it. Yeah. But, uh, I just watched the um Queen, the Queen movie, you know, <gasps> Me Bohemian too. Rhapsody. Yes. And I loved the, you know, like Freddie Mercury was obviously this incredible talent, but he was propelled to where he was at by the restraints and pushback mm-hmm. of his bandmates. And going out on a solo album, he realized that, you right. know, and I thought that was a really 
you know, interpersonal social moment of understanding that, you know, what we have here is not, you know, the sum of the parts is greater. That's so true. And you know. this is going to sound crazy because I'm wearing like an L.L. Bean sweater and like I'm very nerdy, but internally I am like Freddie Mercury. I just am like an outrageous personality. I'm very restrained at work, but I like to swear a lot and I like big, bold ideas and I want to go, go, go. Like I am definitely a conqueror of things and I need that somebody to sort of just be like, eh, maybe we seem to rail yeah, yeah, it back yeah. a little bit, you know? How are you, how are you on, um, like I have people tell me like, Oh, you, you took risk and, and you achieved blah, 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 you know, to, to be able to be where you're at. But I look back on it and we didn't have kids um, I did have to walk away from an architecture education and three years invested into running a business uh, that that was a risk to walk away from, but I didn't have to make an income, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. My wife was working. She's a physical therapist. And so we were, you know, getting by for three to five years while I put everything I could into this to turn it into something. Yeah. Um, I, I often wonder if I am the person that takes risks or not would would other people have done that i don't know um i just knew that i couldn't uh go to the same place every day and work in the same yeah. way i had done that before and that was like well I'll sleep in a paper box thanks but uh, how are you when you uh, when you approach starting the business and all that like how do you see your personality and mindset influencing that i mean i'm not a risk taker generally like I am I like to like weigh the pros and cons of things as outrageous as I am and like I said like Freddie Mercury when it comes to like money or like life choices I'm like I really need to go in this informed there's none of that in this line of work like you are risking it all all the time especially if you want to be good um we risk it all like we turn down projects we don't want we risk That's it all when we one. it's a really hard one when we bid projects like we <clears throat> so and just doing this every day is a risk. It's a huge financial risk. Yeah, and then to tie in, yeah. how are you with um, kind of personal, emotional being tied to uh, a business? So as a, like I'm very guilty of not following on social media or anything else uh, other photographers because when I see anyone else getting work, I feel like I'm going to fail. Okay, me too. Yeah, every day. I see all these and, other builders, and it's especially terrible when you see that they've gotten a job that you really wanted. Right. And you poured yourself <laughs> into, and you're like, like MR Brewer is, I love them. They're a great brand, and they build wonderful houses. But and you just hate it when they get work. I, because, <laughs> right, because I know they're great people. I know they right. do a great job, and I'm like, oh, not only did we not get this, but now I went to like the loveliest people who are going to execute it well, and yeah. it just it stings your insides. Because and at the same time, you know that if everyone that goes with a brewer mm. went with you as well, you couldn't handle all the work, and it would exactly. probably ruin your business. Right. Like, it would turn into something where you're managing rather than creating. Yes, you and know? that's a hard, but it's a hard and, balance to figure out. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's always interesting to me to get other people's feedback. Whenever I share that with other, uh, you know, self-employed creatives, they, they really get it, like, oh, yeah, I, I can't, it's, it's such an emotional roller coaster. It is. To, and I think it's something about being a, tied to what you're doing is creative and it's right. giving of your life, it's giving of your own life experience to turn it into something that is beautiful and create, you know, it's creative. And I think when you're making money off of doing that, you're, you're, you're selling your experience and your abilities, um, and then when that gets rejected, you know, and, and even if it's like they never would have considered using you because you're just not their style or whatever, yeah. it's still like that emotional moment of like, oh, I'm not accepted or cherished or it loved is. or, you know, it's yeah. really hard. I had a, a person recently, one of our projects chose not to work with me and she looked at my portfolio and she's like, it's too busy. And I just, I was like, and I really wanted it. I wanted it bad because it was different and it was very um, unusual up against everything else I've done. And it just, it, yeah, it's hard not to take it personally. Well, I mean, you said it right there. It's unusual yeah. against everything else you've done. And it, I've, that's another interesting thing is to like how, how, you know, some, how do we, we collate 
our portfolio to represent and gravitate towards more of the kind of work we're doing, even when we don't have the kind of work that we want exactly to market to, to get that we, you know, anything that gets close to that, we'll very specifically put that on the website and that on social media and guide it towards that, you know? Right. And I I mean, I don't even think I've had the opportunity to do the things I really want to do yet. I have great clients and I'm, you know, I'm young, I'm still building my portfolio and I'm just hoping that eventually that will come, that people will want something a little bit deeper, a little bit more meaningful, you know, Mm -hmm. past just, okay, I want blue cabinets, you know, I'm, I'm hoping for something bigger someday, you know, (laughs) that's, that's my dream. Yeah. What, what is your dream client when you're, when you're looking for something like that in that sense? I mean, I, I really want someone who is willing to adhere to my philosophy about living in a space that's like I said, connected to nature that is less about brand names or imagery or, you know, the latest trend that they're just like, I want something that has real longevity that will grow with me and, you know, sort of like feed into my humanistic need to be outside. Like that would be, and I don't think it necessarily is a style that comes with that. It's, I think it has to be sort of a more organic thing. Hmm. So you'll have to check out my wife and I's house someday. That's, it's like all those things that you're saying yeah. were the places where we spent money The because we, we lucked into getting really nice land and we're able, we are able to clear us personally with our own four hands. Oh my God, that's amazing. You know, a, a, you know, enough to where we, we were able to situate the house looking down this little valley with these great pieces of ledge. And then the living room just has just a panoramic view of that, you know, and, and that's like our bedrooms are small. There's not a lot of other space, but like we wanted that to really be the experience of, you know, being connected with, yeah. with nature and, and being able to be in the winter inside, but still have, just be able to watch the day and weather pass and really just be part of it. It's it's a, well, that's it, being nice. part of it, experiencing it without being outside. And, you know, I think that for me is like, if someone would come to me and say, okay, I want to just what you said, put my house in this perfectly allocated little cleared spot and let nature just build around it. That would be my dream, right. you know? And then we work from the inside, you know, into the interior so, right. or outside in. Sorry. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for coming all the way yeah. down thanks and for having uh, me. sharing about your processes. Best of luck uh, with your new uh, kind of offshoot business from Thank that. You. And, uh, We'll, we'll be following you online and everything else to, to see how you're doing. So. I'll remember you when I'm famous for sure. <laughs> awesome. Good, good. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again so much. Thank you.